So I titled this morning's message early in the week, not even fully sure what I was going to be talking about, but I, I said how to be a rebel, and that's the thing about Daniel. He was quite a rebel. He didn't, he didn't go with the flow. Uh, the word rebel, right? It's a, it's a person who refuses allegiance to or re- resists, re- uh, rises in arms against the government ruler or his country, but also just a person who resists authority, control, or tradition. And the idea is, you know, you think about someone against a, a specific ruler or a specific thing, but it's also just a person who just dares to be different, to just do things that everyone else is not doing. You got that rebel guy over there who, you know, does things different from everyone else. And that's kind of what we're talking about as a guy who decided to do things a little bit different. Now, Daniel chapter 6, I'm assuming that we're all fairly familiar with Daniel chapter 6. It's Daniel in the lion's den. You know, it's, it's the, we had little kids' books and all the other stuff. We heard these stories in Sunday school. But there's a whole lot of stuff in this chapter. And leading up to, we're going to cover in-depth stuff tonight. But leading up to verse 10, we see Daniel's elevated. He's in charge of, of a huge authority. He's got a lot of responsibilities and then on the flip side, um, these people who are also an authority, they don't like Daniel because Daniel's like favored above everyone else. And so they come up with a plan. We're going to trap him. And so they get the king to pass this law. And the law says that no one can pray to anyone or anything other than the king for 30 days. Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem... He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God and was, as was his custom since early days. Let us pray now. Heavenly Father, I pray that we could have just a little bit of Daniel rub off on us. I pray, God, that as we continue to look at Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Lord, these people who were in Babylon, in difficult times, when everything around them was opposed to them, when, when leaders and peers were against them, that they held fast, they stayed true, and they continued in the things which they had been taught by their parents at a young age. I pray, God, that we would learn to be such people in the times that we live. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Yes. All right. So I want to start because really this morning, I, I, I tricked you all into coming to church today, um, talking about being a rebel. You say that, and everyone's like, well, I'm going to check that out. That sounds like a fun. Um, but this morning, we're just going to look at one part of, of our rebel friend, Daniel. And tonight, we'll be getting a whole lot more. I think the most rebellious thing about Daniel is that he was a man of prayer. Because that's really going against the tradition and it's going against the norm of what most people do. It's a sad thing to say that prayer is not the most popular thing. I think some people feel like, you know, that they pray. And I, but I, I will just say, though, that, you know, when we speak about a, a supernatural book and a supernatural God who's able to meet all of our needs, conquer every mountain, defeat every enemy, and all we have to do is ask... Sometimes our actions don't line up with what we say we believe, and we find ourselves going every which way. And so I want to look just at this one verse. Out of one verse alone, I think we have seven real keys to not just that he prayed, but how he prayed. And I think it's a great model for us, because if there's anything we're going to need as we face the challenges of the day and age in which we live, Praying is going to be one of them. So here are seven things that we're going to notice as we look through this text. Firstly, I say Daniel prayed intentionally. We're just going to walk the verse top to bottom. It says, when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room. He didn't just do this or do that or casually do something. You see, this idea of an upper room, we see it in the Bible. You know, in 1 Kings 17, Elijah had an upper room where he stayed with the widow. 
And then you see in 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, he was staying in an upper room where he would stay when he stayed with his family and their boy, the die that he resurrects, both of them resurrect some, a boy in that upper room. In the day of Pentecost in Acts chapters 1 and 2, they're in the upper room. Now, there's nothing special about being higher up in elevation. You know, getting a little, uh, praying in your attic doesn't really bring you that much closer to God. But having a specific place that you go to pray, it shows intentionality. Intentionality. You're going there with a specific purpose. I'm not just kind of winging out the prayers as I need them. Uh, tonight, you know, a point I want to make is that Daniel is not a guy who gets thrown into a lion's den and then says, oh God, oh God, if you get me out of this one, I promise I'll pray every day. No, Daniel was a guy who went calmly into a lion's den because he prayed every day and he did it intentionally. Jesus makes this comment in the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, right, you go into your room. Now, he doesn't say upper room, but that word for room, it's, it's a secret place, an inner place, a hiding place is the way that room is described. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus said that you need to go somewhere specific where you can focus and be alone. This does not replace those daily prayers that just come as the day goes by. This does not replace those one word prayers as traffic comes in front of you and you go, ah, that's a prayer. It's, it's, if, if you've got a good relationship with the Lord, that can be a very simple prayer that he can hear and understand. But that cannot replace intentional, I'm now going to go and I'm going to spend some time in prayer. Secondly, Daniel prayed biblically. Now, I often find myself encouraging newer believers and younger believers, I don't know how to pray. Well, if you're in that boat, it's real simple. Just talk to God. It's, it is that simple. But to have power in prayer, if you want to see your prayer life grow, if you want to see real effectiveness, fervent, effectual prayer, then we can look to the Bible, and there's many examples on how to pray. In fact, this is where I can plug all my favorite books, right? Our little bookstore back there that's currently Mother's Room because it's between the hours of 10 o'clock and noon or whatnot. When the service is over, the bookstore is open. But that said, uh, How to Pray by R.E. Torrey, Power Through Prayer by E.M. Bounds. I could just go down the list. These are amazing books about prayer and that really help instruct us. Look at what Jesus did. Look at what they did in the Bible. Now, how is he praying biblically? Well, if you see there, it says he went to his upper room and his windows open toward Jerusalem. You know what this is not a commentary on? Honestly, I don't think it's really what the intention of the text is. Some people think that, look at Daniel, they say you can't pray, and so he goes and he opens his window. The actual, the tense is there in the grammar. The windows were already open for what it's worth. He didn't go, and now I'm going to swing these bad boys open and Realistically, if you're on the second, the, or the uppermost story of your house and the windows are open and you're in there praying, no one from the street can see in your house. I mean, unless they're sitting there straight on trying to see. It wasn't about being seen. It was about 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And guess what we're going to do now? Let's flip on over to 2 Chronicles chapter 6, okay? This is good stuff. You want to have this in your Bible written down and highlighted so you can find it. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, it's also in 1 Kings is the, this is the, um, I lost the word. They just built a temple and they had a big celebration to kick it off. What's that called? De dedication, celebration. I think the dedication is a specific word. I actually looked at my Bible and it said it, that helped. Um, the dedication of the temple, okay? They're dedicating the temple and Solomon gives this big sermon. And it builds and builds and builds. And we're kind of just catching the tail end of the sermon. But here's the thing. In verse 36 of 2 Chronicles 6, it says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. There's a whole sermon right there. You become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy and take them captive to a land far or near. Now, this is building up. If you read everything in chapter 6, it talks about the smaller things. God will do this to get their attention. He'll do that to get their attention. He'll start to send famine. He'll start to send this. This was the final straw. These people keep rebelling against me. 
I'm going to have the enemy come and take them away. It's their land, but we're going to take them from their land. Yet, it's a beautiful word in verse 37, when they have come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we've done wrong and have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they've been carried captive and pray toward their land, which you gave their fathers, the city which you have chosen and toward the temple, which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling, in your, your dwelling place their prayer and their supplications. Maintain their cause and forgive your people because they have sinned against you. I'll stop right there. The rest is this beautiful text. But that was the prayer. And as a good Jewish boy, Daniel would have known, right? Man, God, you said it. When we get carried away, it's because of our sin. We sin, we end up in stupid places because of our sin. But when we come to our senses, the Jewish people were told, turn and face your city. Don't turn and face the land. Turn and face Jerusalem. Turn and look to the temple. And so Daniel knew the situation he was in. God said, when you're in this situation, turn and face Jerusalem and pray. So what does he do? He goes to his house, he opens his windows, and he faces Jerusalem. This is very specific to Daniel and to those people, but it shows he knew the word. He knew the promises of the word, and so he could pray those promises. When we know the word of God, we can pray those things with a confidence because it's like, well, God, this isn't about me. It's all about you. I'm in a foreign land. It says when you're in a foreign land. I've come to my senses. I realize that we've done messed up, God, and you said when we come to our senses, we pray. So what am I supposed to do? Well, the Bible says start facing Jerusalem and praying. And so out of obedience, that's what he does. The third thing we see him do is pray humbly. He opened his windows toward Jerusalem, and it says he knelt down on his knees. You know, there's no right or wrong way to pray physically, like the way we stand, face, this, that. But there is something humble about being on your knees. There's something about you kneel before a king, before a dignitary. That's kind of the idea is you're kneeling down before God. Jesus kneeled at least sometimes when he prayed in Luke in the Garden of Gethsemane, chapter 22, verse 41. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed, right? This is when he prays, Lord, you know, if it's all possible, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus knelt when he prayed. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, I will, it's my desire, therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know that lifting your hands in prayer is a fairly biblical thing to do. It doesn't mean it's like more right or better, but we have lots of biblical examples of people lifting up their hands and actually looking up to heaven and praying to God. You know what's the thing you won't find an example of in the Bible? It's folding your hands and bowing your head. <laughs> and it's not wrong to do that. But we just, we don't see, we see people actually lifting their hands. We see people laying on the ground in prayer. It's quite often what's so normal to us is not actually the normal thing we read about. And what's the funny thing about lifting up your hands and praying without doubting, like, because right now you think to yourself, perhaps, I'm like, I don't know. I feel kind of awkward up here. I'm standing here. I mean, I'm doing a demonstration, so it makes it less awkward, but, you know, we're going to have closing worship today. Wouldn't it just be weird and make you feel strange and uncomfortable to, I'm doing it. This feels weird, but I'm doing it. But the funny thing is, is that is, it is kind of sad that what feels so strange is actually the examples we're given in the Bible. We live in a day and age where it's strange to be living the word of God out in our lives. You know, when you lift your hands up, I feel very vulnerable. 
I mean, like I'm, I'm exposing my torso. There's something actually about defense. You do this when you want to be defensive because you're covering up your, there's just a natural instinct. And yet doing this, I'm exposed, I'm vulnerable. And it's the worldwide, everyone knows, sign for surrender. My hands are in the air, I give up. He kneeled. It doesn't say where his hands were doing. But whether you're kneeling down, laying face first on the ground, or have your hands in the air, it, it, it is about a humility before the Lord. And it is. This was alone. There was no one watching him. No one could see his hands, his knees, or what he did. I will say the first time I feel like I ever had breakthrough in prayer, and I'll say that again, maybe you've never experienced what I would call a breakthrough in prayer. Something changed in me that day. I was at a men's retreat. To be honest, I didn't like the message that was being given, and so I left. I walked out, went back to my room, but I was troubled, and so I decided to pray, and for the first time in my life, I lay down on the ground with my face and nose flat on the floor, and I prayed for hours, and I had never done that in my entire life. But in that moment, I felt like God was talking back, and I could hear, and I didn't want to leave. People came and left the room asking me if I was okay. I'm like, I'm fine. I was alone at first, but you know, I had roommates, you know, retreat. And I just felt like God was speaking back to me. And I, and I wouldn't leave. I just said, Lord, I'm not going to go until everything is aired out to dry. If there's anything we need to talk about, let's talk about it right now. And for after that day, I prayed face down on the ground for weeks. It did wear off. I reverted back into old habits, and I didn't pray like that for quite a while. But I had been a Christian for some time. Until something happened, it humbled me. It got me on my knees. It got me on my face. And I spent time talking to God. And once I experienced that, I could never unexperience it. Just an intimacy with God that can only ever, I believe, be found in prayer. Another thing about Daniel is he prayed regularly. As we see, it says he knelt down on his knees and three times that day, he prayed and gave thanks. For the people who like grammar, <laughs> our words uh, kneeling, knelt, the verb, praying, and praising, it's, it's, it gave thanks is the word praise. They're all verbs, actions. They're all imperfective tense, i.e., it, it's an ongoing action. It's he was kneeling down and he was praying and he was continually giving thanks he prayed three times a day. I won't ask how many of us struggle to get one dedicated specific time of prayer in a day. It's something we do see in the Bible. In Psalm 55, this idea of three times even. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Praying in the morning to start your day. Praying in the middle of the day to fill you up. Praying before you go to bed. David says it pretty nice. So God, you are my God, and early I will seek you. Why does he wake up early? Because my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. You ever feel like you're living in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water? If water being a picture of the Holy Spirit, if water being something that satisfies your soul, you go to work, you go out, there's nothing out here that satisfies. And so I've got to seek God if I want that satisfaction. A few verses later in Psalm 63, David says, when I remember you on my bed and I meditate on you in the night watches. You want a suggestion. How does one pray three times a day? I'll tell you what, it's really simple. In the morning, you pray about what you're going to need to get through that day. I love the old Martin Luther quote. I've got so much to do today, I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. Because he just realized, like, if I'm going to get through today, I'm going to have to actually pray more. And isn't there something kind of fun and like faith about that? I'm busy, and so I'm going to do something illogical, something that man, it doesn't make sense to man. I'm going to take some of my precious time that I really need to get these things done, and I'm going to set it aside and give it to God let him use that time however he wants in me and then trust that he'll be faithful to provide for me the rest of the hours of that day. 
That's what praying in faith is. And in the morning, we pray for that a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, God. I can't make it through this day. I can't make it through my marriage. I can't make it through the Walmart checkout unless your Holy Spirit is with me. <laughs> and at night, how many of us could every night after Netflix is off, <clears throat> after your spouse falls asleep, after whatever, and just you don't have to even kneel at the side of your bed. Just lay down and close your eyes and let the last thoughts in your mind simply be, God, I have a list of things that are worth being thankful about today. Here are the things that you've done for me today. God, I have a list of things I need to confess today. When that person called, I was busy and I was rude. I didn't care for them the way you desire me to care. God, I was covetous as I saw what my friend just got. Lord, I was lustful. God, I was this. And spent a little bit of time just confessing every night to wake up in the morning to seek him again for a fresh filling. And I'll tell you what, middle of the day, you could take five minutes off your lunch break and literally just sit in silence and say, God, I'm giving you five minutes. Tell me whatever you want, and I'm just going to sit here and listen. And I think if you did that regularly, God would speak. Just because all of a sudden it starts, okay, Lord, you can be, you slow down, slow down. I'm not going to be able to go to sleep tonight because I have all these things I have to confess now that I'm actually listening and having you tell me the things. It's God will speak. And Daniel prayed regularly. I don't think we can ever pray too much. I really don't. There is a time to act. There is a time to do. But on the flip side, most of us don't struggle with praying too much. Now, Daniel prayed thankfully, and I t touched on that just slightly, you know, at night, we can give God our praise, but it says he prayed and gave thanks, right? This is like a one-two punch. If you want good prayers, give God a little thanksgiving in there. Not just the I need, 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 but then, you know, Lord, thank you that I even have a house that requires a mortgage that I need to pay. <laughs> thank you, God, that I have kids at all that I need your help raising, Thank you, Lord, that I have a spouse to whom I can fight with. Thank you, God, that I... But I mean, it is. It's like we have all the prayers of helping me in my marriage, help me with my kids, help me pay the bills. And it's like, thank you, God, I have something I need to pay for. Thank you that I have children. Thank you that I... There's so much to be thankful for. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for fill in the blank with your name. I mean, that's the idea. Is it the will of God? The will of God is for us to be thankful in everything. Wouldn't we just be weird if, like, we walked around and <laughs> we're always thankful? People would start thinking Christians are different, huh? Those weirdos, they're always happy. They're always thankful. I'll tell you what, I thought my wrestling coach was a weirdo. And I started going to the same church as him years later. But, and I remember not getting it when he would say things like, you know, hey, coach, sprained my ankle. He's like, just be thankful you have hands. And we were like, what? You don't make any sense, coach. You're weird. And then later, you start talking to him. He's like, well, you know, like, you're complaining. He's like, he's like, but I've, he's like, I've been to Kenya, and I've talked to people, and the kids are like, oh, I know. You think we're not that tough. I mean, we get to eat weekly, but the people in Sudan, sometimes they don't eat for every two weeks. And he's like, it just changes your mindset when you realize, like, wow, I live in America. And there might be some bad things, but I've got a whole longer list of things to be thankful for than I really have to complain about. And so he gave thanks, and that's a big deal. And I might, I might bring that up again a little bit later. As was his custom since early days, Daniel prayed faithfully. He didn't do a week of morning, noon, and night. And I absolutely, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, believe this morning, noon, and night prayer with the open window, it did not happen after the king passed the don't pray rule. It was a long-going custom, as the word says. This was his custom since the early days. We are told in Colossians chapter 4, continue earnestly in prayer. That word earnestly is steadfastly. Continuing steadily, meaning you get a momentum and you keep that momentum and you keep the ball rolling. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. How many of us have pushed a car? And you know, once the car's rolling, 
You know, you can kind of just jog behind and kind of do one of those things. Moving a stopped car is hard. Getting it to get going. And I know for so many of us, the hardest part with a prayer life is just getting it started, getting it rolling. But once it's rolling, we do have to continue in it steadfastly and earnestly. And he was faithful since the early days. Remember way long ago, we were in Daniel chapter 1, and in verse 8, it says, Daniel purposed in his heart. Now, he purposed in his heart not to be defiled, but let's remember now, and we'll talk a little more about this tonight, give you the bigger details, but he was taken from his home, ripped away from his parents, probably 14 to 17 years old. He's now in his mid to late 80s by Daniel chapter 6. The same boy who had a grandma or a mom or someone who was pouring into him, he started off faithful, and here he is 70 years later, and he's still holding fast to what mom and dad taught him. There is a significance to training up a child in the way he should go that we raise our kids not just through teaching them what to do, but we demonstrate to our children what to do, that they see us. <laughs> I really thought he was going to make me proud. He, he, he pulled it through, but at the father-son camp last year, I was speaking, and, and I just called Judah out on the spot. It's like, Judah, if you wake up in the morning, where's dad? He's like, you're on the couch. What am I doing? He's like, you're on the phone. I'm like, what am I doing on my phone, Judah? He's like, you're reading your Bible. I'm like, thank you, Judah. You <laughs> redeemed yourself. <laughs> you redeemed yourself. But I know that he knows that's where I'll be. He knows where I am every morning. He knows where to find me. He can wake up to go to the bathroom. He usually does wake up to go to the bathroom, and I say hi to him as he goes back to bed. But there's a faithfulness there, and there is something. Isn't there just something amazing about faithfulness? Like when you see someone who's held out for years and years and just was faithful, wasn't amazing, wasn't talented, was just faithful, because you can't fake faithful, because either you were or you weren't. It's not easy to remain faithful in some of these things, but he was faithful in prayer. My last point, Daniel prayed the word. Now, not just biblically, point one was biblically, like he, 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 he did biblical things in his prayer life, but specifically, he was praying out the promises of the word of God. Now, I'm not giving you a specific verse on this one. that we, we finished the end of the verse. But here's the catch. If you're in Daniel 6, I know you all are because we're good Christians. We follow along our Bibles. Let's flip over to Daniel chapter 9 real quick. So just a couple little things before we do our next big flip is chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Hazarus, Etc. In the first year of his reign, it says in verse 2. Okay. So what we know is, is that chapter 9 takes place the same time or before chapter 6. There's actually some chron chronology that's out of order. Chapters 1 through 6 in Daniel, you're going to find out that chapters 7 and 8 took place before chapter 6. So as we get there, we'll talk more about that. But we know that chapter 9 has already happened. And it says in verse 2, I, Daniel, understood by the books that the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accommodate the 70 years of the desolation in Jerusalem. And so I turned and uh, my, set my face toward the Lord, made requests praying and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, ashes. So he's praying to Jerusalem. This is kind of, again, they tie in together. But here's the catch is that how did he know about this? How did he know about the 70 years that they were going to be in Babylon? Because he had read the book and the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. Let's flip over to Jeremiah chapter 29. That would be to your left. Couple of books. I didn't use a bookmark. That way, you know, we're all, we're all on the same playing field here. I'll skip over a couple little things, but this is what you have to understand. Chapter 29, verse 1. Now, these are the words of the letter 
that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, prophets, all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So chapter 29 of Jeremiah, a few of those verses of which many of us are very familiar with, let's remember the context. This was a letter that Jeremiah wrote to the captives in Babylon. Daniel, more than likely, was probably even the first guy to receive the letter because he's ruling the country at this point pretty much. He's like second in charge. And he receives this letter. It would have been earlier on. It would have been much earlier at this point. So this letter would have been years back. And he writes this letter to them. In verse 4, he starts really the letter. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 5, he says, Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens to eat of their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and your daughters to your husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. You see, Daniel had the promises of this letter. We'll keep rolling. But first and foremost, Jeremiah tells Daniel, I know you're in Babylon. I know the world looks crazy around you. And I know, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. But you know what? Take care of your home. Have kids. Have grandkids. See your kids get married. Live life, Daniel. Daniel. Jeremiah tells him, live life. But verse 7, it says, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace, you will have peace. I'll say it again. For in its peace, you will have peace. He tells Daniel, pray for your town. Pray for where you live. Pray for the nation where God has placed you because in its peace, you will have peace. You ought to be praying for where you live. Paul echoes this in the New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 2 again. He says, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And the idea is that especially those for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this, praying for your leadership, is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We prayed, not every week, but as it was laid on Roberta, who normally leads prayer on her heart, we prayed for President Trump during his time in office. We prayed for President Obama before him. We'll be praying for President Biden now, just like we ought to be praying for our governor, for our mayor, for all the people who are in our authority, because even if our sinful hearts, let's just be honest, don't want to see some people get saved. (laughs) I mean, you never, none of you have ever said that about anyone in politics, right? That person can just, you know what they can go do. But the Bible says, you know, it's actually really pleasant to God to see his children praying because God desires that all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. There's no one that God wants to see in hell. That's what the Bible says. And so as I pray for these people, I'm praying that some of them have the Holy Spirit upon them, that for power and strength, and there's other people, it's like, Lord, save their wretched soul and then transform them by your Holy Spirit, that they see the wickedness of their ways and they repent. You can pray for anyone. Because Jesus pretty much fixes everything if people fully surrender to him. Now, I'll make this one kind of short, but here's seven steps on how to pray for your city that you live in. Maybe I'll have to take pictures of this. I'll have to share it later. But first one, you start close and you pray for your neighbors. Jesus, on the, when he ascended into heaven, right, he says you always see power you know, to be witnesses to the promise of the Father so that you can be witnesses to me in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Quite often, we really do need to start in Jerusalem and then move out to Judea, to the region, Samaria, the whole area. Pray for your neighbors. Pray that they would realize that their barking dog is a nuisance. Pray that that they'd get saved. Pray that they would, you know, and 
Pray that they would be blessed by your presence. Pray that you would have a good testimony in front of them and that your being their neighbor would draw them closer to Jesus. Pray for our schools. It's the future of where we live, right? I mean, it's a big deal. I homeschool. doesn't mean I'm not going to pray for all the kids who aren't. I got lists. You can take a picture. I mean, I'll share it on uh, Facebook later or something like that. Pray for Henry Strom. He's our superintendent. Pray for Kim Casey, high school, right? Pray for the middle school principal and all the elementary school principals. Pray for the school board. Pray for Pastor Tony Sanchez that he can hold strong on the school board and represent Jesus Christ when things come before our schools. It's a good idea to write them down and just say, you know, Lord, at least once a week, I'm going to pray for our schools. Pray for our city leadership. And you know what? You can make a sunny side list and a prosser list, right? I just did Grandview to keep it simple. Pray for our mayor. Pray for our city council. And if you really run out of things to pray for, you can pray for the fire chief. Right, Pat? No, we got, we got the police chief, the fire. I mean, there's, there's people who run this city and people who are our city and the people in it. They're depending on these people. And wouldn't it be awesome if they were all saved and all had the Holy Spirit working in them and that they wanted to glorify God and all that they did in the lower valley? Pray for businesses. I'm going to let you guys know I found this list online. I, I, you know, I, I grand viewified it, but I did find the list. So it's not my own original thoughts, but it was a good list. I liked it. This is actually top to bottom, just some of the, the, the top uh, employers in our city. I think the school district should be on there, and it's not, but I just looked up, you know, top employers in Grandview, the DC, Fruit Smart, Conrad Adams. Wouldn't it be cool if revival broke out at Conrad Adams? You know, Charles Finney was a revival preacher, and they talk about how he was going to go preach at a, at a factory, had about 3,000 people working at this factory back in the old sweatshop days, right? All these people working there, and they were not happy that he was coming. And they were saying, oh, they're not going to send this preacher over here. And the story goes, he, he walks in, and some woman's looking at him, and he just stares at her. And she breaks down crying and starts repenting of her sins. <laughs> and the entire factory gets saved as people are turning to Jesus because revival broke out not in a church, not at a prayer meeting, but at a workplace, you could be a key element in seeing revival at your workplace. Public spaces. This was an interesting one, but it's like, yes, Lord, bless our parks and keep wicked and evil stuff out of our parks so that they're safe for our children. Bless the libraries. Get rid of all the stupid books. Give them some better ones. And there's, I mean, I'm saying they're not all stupid. You know what I mean, right? Get, there's some bad stuff in every public library. So it's like, Lord... Get, every, get all the librarians saved, and so they accidentally lose a bunch of books. You know what I mean? The museum, every place. And hey, Gretchen Cronus, I'm saying, I just look at our city leaders. Hey, bless her, that she would bless the town. The people of our town in general, or another town. And I was just thinking of other things. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a great food bank. Pray for them that the food bank feeds the hungry people of our town. Pray for the Awamis that they take care of the school-age kids there at the Extra Mile Center. Pray for Melanie at Life Options that unborn children would see light of day in our town. Pray for the people who are homeless. Pray for the people who are hurting. Pray for the people who know they need God and they, they just don't know how because they've had some bad experiences with churches in the past and the people they met were phony or fake or judgmental and they're just wishing that someone would show them the real God, the God of the Bible who loves them. And last but not least, pray for all the churches, this church and all the rest. You all know the signs, right? I mean, pray over the churches, Pray for the good churches that they would grow and flourish. And if there's churches that you feel convicted because you have doctrinal beliefs, you're like, you know, Lord, I think those churches may have some issues. Pray that the issues get resolved. Pray that maybe if there's something bad in a church that the pastor would come to his senses and we're leaving that denomination and we're changing. And there are churches that that needs to happen in. And if people are praying for the churches, there's much better chance that these things will happen. And so we're praying becoming people of prayer, praying for our town. Now, there is some more good stuff in, in Jeremiah 29. He says, pray for your city. 
Then he warns them in verse 8. Thus says Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to the dreams which you cause to be dreamed, which they cause you to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, thus says the Lord. And so this is the idea is that pray that people don't get deceived by the weird stuff that is going around these days. There's a lot of people teaching weird things. And he's saying, in your midst, there are going to be people who are going to try and lead you away from the truth to believe in a lie, right? That's actually even talked about in the end times that the Antichrist would come and by miracles, signs, and wonders, right? That he would lead people from the truth to believe in lies. That we could get distracted from the gospel to be focused on other things or believing in weird things. I've seen the people whom I love the most and have taught me so much about the Bible now into weird cultish type stuff because they were watching someone on YouTube and they got convinced and they started going down a weird road. And so we pray, God protect the church. God protect my friends and myself that we're not deceived by the weirdness going around. He mentions the 70 years in verse 10 and then verse 11, where many of us are familiar. This is God, almighty, and I, I have no problem saying this is God talking to you personally. God is speaking now, and he says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And then you'll call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I'll bring you back from your captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations from the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I'll bring you to the place from which I've caused you to be carried captive. That's the idea is no matter where you're at, how far away you've been carried, no matter how far you stray, God says, hey, when you call on me, I'm not going to leave you hanging because I love you. I know the thoughts I think about you. They're of peace. I have good intentions for you. Never question my love. And I will bring you back if you'll just turn to me and seek my face. You see, knowing this, having a pattern of prayer where Daniel was daily praying this into existence in his life, then, and only then, I think, when the king says, I'm passing a law and I want you to change, Daniel probably didn't skip a beat. He didn't have to pray about what to do and how to handle the situation because he just knew I'm just going to continue on what I've always done. This is the way I am. This is what I believe. And this is how I'm going to live. Corey Ten Boon said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Quite often, that's our spare tire, right? The emergency comes. Now I need to seek God because now I really need some help. The Bible says to be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your request be known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus, right? So here's the idea is that if you want to have mind-blowing peace, this is one of my favorite sections of text because I just haven't met too many people who aren't excited or interested in the concept of mind-blowing peace, peace that surpasses understanding. It's so much peace, my brain can't wrap my mind around it. Like, how can someone have so much peace? And it comes through prayer. Through prayer, that's the talking to God, supplication, that's asking, and thanksgiving. And we see Daniel, obviously he's talking to God, and we see him praying. That was probably asking for supplication. Well, Lord, you see what's going on at work. Things aren't looking very good. Um, they're, they're telling me I'm not supposed to pray, but here I am again anyway. And thanksgiving. But you know what? Thank you, God, that I'm still alive. Thank you that I'm in my mid-80s and I'm still leading a country, that I'm being used by you in powerful places. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then you can be anxious for nothing. Uh, I like the old King James. It says, be careful for nothing. Now, it doesn't mean careful like cautious. It means careful like full 
of cares. You see, I have found sometimes it's mistaken for apathy, but when crazy stuff's going on in the world, I just don't care that much. It's not apathy. It's a peace that whether the world is falling apart or everything is prim and proper, my life doesn't change very much. I need to be seeking the Lord daily. I need to be sharing the gospel. I need to be loving people like Jesus has commanded me to love them. It doesn't matter what changes around me. Those things just keep on happening. And I don't need to be worried about everything that's changing because my calling doesn't change. Be a Christian. And so I continue in these things. This idea of cares, worries. We're going to do a Bible study. I got my phone. This will be fun. I'm not just supposed to teach you the Bible. I'm supposed to teach you how to use the Bible. Blue Letter Bible, Strong's Concordance. Let's see here. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful. I already know it's marim na'o. It's the word for cares or worry. To be anxious, it's a verb. 19 times in the New Testament. But check this out. Here we go. This idea of worrying being full of cares. Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Matthew 6. He says, don't worry about your clothing. Same chapter. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Same chapter. Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 10. And when they deliver you up, as he says in Luke, the equivalent, when they live, deliver you up before the governmental leaders, don't worry about what you're going to say. Because I will give you the words you should speak in that hour. Now, the other place it shows up, Luke, it's like a lot of duplicates, right? Same verse, different book. But in Luke 10, only Luke records the story where he goes, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. And I wonder if the Lord Jesus was here today, if you could put your name in there. You are worried and troubled about many things. And yet, this is the very word we're commanded not to do. Do not worry. Same Greek word. Do not be anxious. Do not be full of these cares for anything. In 1 Corinthians, in three places in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about all the cares that come through marriage. That marriage can add a lot of cares in your life, and that's a reality. The Bible affirms it, that it will add a lot of things. But in 1 Corinthians 12, the last two places this word shows up other than Philippians 4, 6, he says, let there be no schism, division in the body, that's us, the church, but that the members should have the same care for one another. We're commanded to care. All these, do not care, do not worry, do not be anxious, do not care. But when it comes to us as a family, he goes, you can care about that. There's one thing you can care about. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're going to have one thing, what's a care? It is a thought that tugs on your heart. If you are trying to do something and there's these thoughts that keep tugging at you, those are those cares. They're things that are, they stay on your mind and they, they tug at you and try and get you to act, behave, and do certain things. These cares that get me out of the world or out of the place I'm supposed to be. He says, you can care for one another. And in Philippians 2.20, Paul says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Paul's saying, I can't find anyone who cares about you guys like I do. He's like, I, 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 I ache and I care about you, your well-being, your growth, your testimony, your witness in this world. I wish I could find other people who cared like me. And that's how Paul felt about those Philippians. But he tells him Philippians 4, right? Rejoice. I say again, rejoice. He's telling him, rejoice in the Lord always. And don't worry about all these other things. And he goes to you know, verse 7, 8. The Philippians 4 is just a great chapter, right? He tells him, meditate on all these things, whatever is good and holy, true, pure, noble, good report. He goes, you, that's what you need to be thinking about, not all this other junk. He's like, I've learned to have a lot, have nothing, to be naked or to be well clothed. Because through Christ, I can face all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. That's what it says. It really means I can face anything because of Jesus. Whatever gets thrown my way, I can handle it because of Jesus. And I think this kind of peace comes when people pray. And I think prayer like this is found in Daniel. And I think just as much as it was said back then in the days of Asa, king of Judah, as it is today, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong 
on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God wants to show himself strong, his power and his might. And all he's looking for is people with loyal hearts that he can shine through. If you want to be a rebel, if you want to do something different from everyone else, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to hold fast in these things that we know we ought to do. And sometimes it's just hard to get that ball rolling. But with the Lord's help, you can. Let's pray.